We are now joined by David Sirota. He's an award-winning American journalist and author. He served as Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign speechwriter in 2020. He created the Financial Crisis podcast series Meltdown, and he helped Adam McKay create the story for the film Don't Look Up. He is a columnist at The Guardian, editor at large at Jacobin Magazine, and founder and editor of The Lever. I, I am, uh, I'm going to try to impress you. Welcome, David Sirota. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I've been holding on to this. It was either going to be you or if I had Adam McKay on the show. The Mark Ryland character in Don't Look Up. Yes. I, I'm just, I, this is what I'm utterly convinced of. Is it based on Doe from Heaven's Gate? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, this is the thing, like, I've been waiting to either spring on you or Adam. I've been holding on to the. Remember Doe? Yeah. He was the, he was the uh, musical. He, he uh, Broadway, he failed in Broadway musical, so he created a cult in San Diego. You know, I think um, uh, you're talking about Heaven's Gate. The cult, the actual cult, not the movie. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. everybody. yeah, I mean, he kind of looks like that guy. And I, I, it's funny, I was actually living out in San Diego uh, at the time on a, on a newspaper internship when that all went down, which was crazy. Um, uh, and the answer is, uh, I, I don't have an answer for you. Um, he's kind of an amalgam of a lot of oligarchs. Uh, Mark Rylance, uh, I think, has said that he took some inspiration in the way he portrayed it uh, uh, from Elon Musk. Um, but certainly, uh, it is kind of an amalgam of an oligarch and somebody who, uh, believes almost religiously, uh, in their own bullshit. Uh, right. and so that's what that character really is. And I think we've now gotten used to those kinds of oligarchs, um, unfortunately running the world. Right. Joe was going to, they, they were going to fly up to a, to a comet, but that's it right. was necessary, but that's you had right. to cut your... You had to castrate yourself. Yeah. Or, or they, I think it was, a, it was a doomsday cult and they all commit suicide. Yeah. 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 Getting people to castrate themselves. Yeah. That seems to be the Republican party right now. <laughs> this, it is a doomsday cult, isn't it? It does feel, I mean, the Republican party really does feel like a genuinely a, a, a doomsday cult. Uh, when you look at it on everything from climate to the, to the economy, to, to democracy. I mean, it really, we're really living. It really does feel like we're living in in some kind of end times right now. And it's some days it can be it can be difficult to to do the kind of work that we do of journalism and reporting on it. But but put it this way, I don't think I don't think you're crazy. And I don't think anybody who's listening is crazy for um, seeing the Republican Party as a kind of doomsday cult. Because I think I think that's actually it's not even casting a value judgment. It just kind of is what it is. So I want to ask you about a story you have over at Lever, uh, levernews.com. Go to levernews.com. The only way I'm getting David Sirota back on this show is if there's a bump <laughs> in subscriptions to <laughs> levernews.com. So do me a favor, and it's $8 a month, and it, you'll... I'll tell you what, if you sign up for levernews.com and you don't like it, I'll reimburse you. Just <laughs> It's got the Feldman stamp. Thank I you. I want to ask you about uh, they are not even pretending anymore, the piece yeah. you were. But, but you worked on the Goldbergs. I did. I did. Well, I, 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 didn't, I didn't work on the Goldbergs. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a character on the Goldbergs because I grew you up with Adam right? Goldberg. Oh, you didn't write on the Goldbergs? No, 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 no. I've been, I've been on the Goldbergs, and there is a character on the Goldbergs who is David Sirota because uh, I grew up with Adam Goldberg. So he is telling the story of the town and the life that, that we grew up in. I see. So being a speech writer for Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Now, you've been tweeting out that you're in love with Bernie Sanders. <laughs> you've, you've confessed <laughs> I know your wife is in the state assembly in Colorado. Uh, my wife is a state legislator here in Colorado. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, their session you've just admitted, ended. You're, you're, you've admitted to this love of what is it? I, I want to ask you about Bernie Sanders. What, sure. what is it like writing for him? What can you tell us that you've learned from Bernie in terms of messaging? 
because I think he and Ralph Nader understand messaging. Well, I, I would agree with you in the sense that um, Bernie Sanders knows how to stay on message, uh, knows how to deliver a message, and is always focused on delivering a message in uh, vernacular and language that everybody can understand. Um, he, I mean, and that's uh, that's by design. So when you're writing speeches for Bernie Sanders, you're not writing really um, necessarily highfalutin speeches with flowery language. You're writing uh, in language deliberately so to try to simply connect with as many people as possible. So I think the um, experience of of practicing that, of of working on that, of knowing uh, that that is the is the mission, I think actually transferred fairly well from, you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. So when you're, when I write stories, I'm trying to write stories that anybody can understand. So I think the actual work of being a speechwriter for somebody like Bernie Sanders, there are a lot of overlaps uh, in that. Uh, and of course, I, I'm a, I'm a kind of an, an investigative journalist that does a lot of adversarial accountability journalism. And, you know, some people have said to me, why have you gone in and out of working in politics and journalism? And that's a little bit weird. And I, I don't see it as weird. It's all part of the same work. I mean, journalism is supposed to be questioning assumptions, challenging power. Bernie Sanders and a lot of the other campaigns that I've worked on are the same thing. I mean, I don't, I don't just work for any, I, I haven't just worked for any kind of, you know, Democrats. I've worked for people like Bernie Sanders or people in positions uh, that are trying to shake the status quo. Right. And that's what journalism is supposed to be about. And I think a lot of times that's forgotten in journalism now, because journalism, I think, frankly, we're living in an era where what is called journalism is really about protecting power and, and protecting the status quo. I mean, when you turn on your television and you watch uh, network news, cable news, it it really does feel like a defense of the status quo, a defense of, of the of the establishment and the political machinery and the oligarchy. It does not really feel like um, content in a lot of ways that is that is questioning uh, assumptions and challenging the status quo. And I, I think that's that's pretty bad. Now, what we're trying to do with The Lever is something different. We're a reader supported news organization. And part of the reason why we're reader supported is because I think you need to have that kind of reader support to be able to do reporting uh, that does not placate uh, big money and and power that that actually right. questions big money and power. Right. So everybody go to levernews.com. That's L-E-V-E-R news.com. It's eight dollars a month. You need to support levernews.com, especially since it means we might be able to get David to come back. So go to levernews.com. <laughs> it's it's great. And if if you don't like it, I will reimburse you. That's how much I believe. You're a great writer. I, you know. I put you in the same category as William Sapphire and Pat Buchanan because your politics are not the same. They were, however, speechwriters and they learned how to write clearly. You write very, very clearly. You don't write. Thank you. That's, to, that's high praise. Yeah. You write to explain things. And that's what politics is. That's what speech making is. It's explaining. And journalism, sometimes, I think sometimes we get too caught up in our florid usage and trying to show off that, you know, we're great writers uh, rather than passing along some information. Did Bernie change your politics? How much of a leftist were you before you were exposed to Bernie? I'm going to assume you were left of center were you as were you always as much a diehard leftist as you are now, or did Bernie change that for you? You know, um, when I first got to work for Bernie Sanders, I had pretty, I think, moderate or really undefined politics. Frankly, I mean, it what was very it was very long ago. It was it was uh, end of the nineteen nineties. Um, I first worked for Bernie Sanders as his press secretary when he was in the house and I had just gotten out of college and I'd worked on a couple of campaigns and um, I sort of sent in my resume to a bunch of places on Capitol Hill. I would grown up as a kind of a you know, big D Democrat, you know, I, you know, I was a young person. I didn't really have politics. And I went to a, a university that, that was kind of a, um, not known as a very political student body, Northwestern university. And I went for journalism. And so um, when I went to work for Bernie, I, I really didn't have, well-formed politics beyond sort of 
not liking the Republicans and knowing I was essentially not a Republican. Um, working for Bernie Sanders in 1999 into 2001, so at the end of the Clinton era into the uh, Bush era, uh, was uh, probably the most formative political experience of my whole life. Uh, just those two and a half years on the Hill working for him to be able to watch how Congress worked through the this uh this office that was in the only independent in the Congress was just incredible. And, and his focus on, you know, the issues that we know he focuses on the kitchen table issues, economic issues, following the money, corruption, that kind of thing was just something I had never been exposed to. And that really was, and I've told him that it was the absolute formative political experience of my entire life. It remains the formative political experience. Um, I, I would say this, not not that I I steer away from, you know, quote, left and right, but I, I do think those terms are sort of scrambled now. And, you know, I I don't know how I don't know what to label my own politics other than my politics are, I guess the closest I can come is kind of new new deal, new new deal FDR kind of right. economic politics. Um, the that's answer not a, is democracy. The answer is get everyone the right to vote, get them in this temple of democracy in Washington, D.C., and let the people decide. I, it's not Marxism or capitalism. It's just let everyone vote yeah. and we decide what's best for everybody. Uh, I think yeah. we get caught up on ide ideology. What is best for everybody, not who's yeah. smarter? Yeah. And make sure that every and democracy means that everybody has, if not an equal say that everybody has, because you can never have. I, I mean, that's the that's the goal. Um, but right now we have I mean, truly, we have oligarchy where where the right to, the right to vote itself is under attack. But even the uh, preserved rights to vote are limited. And, and I think we need to understand that they're limited as just the best example. Right. I mean, you can vote for your U.S. senator, but your vote counts more or less depending on what state you live in. So if you really start thinking about how limited our democracy is in the sense of like how extreme it is to try to prevent people from actually voting, that's the tip of the iceberg in the sense of how much your vote actually matters has been limited. I mean, it's been limited in so many ways, how the Supreme Court, which isn't elected at all, has so much power over things. The US Senate, which is fundamentally undemocratic, and then you add the filibuster. So it's if you really think about how extreme it is to try to prevent people from just casting a vote, considering all of the other ways your vote's power has been limited, it really is hard to say that we we live in a functioning democracy anymore. But I do agree with you. Ultimately, if you do have a much more functioning democracy, whether it's workplace democracy, unions, uh, or and into the political sphere of democracy, you, you, my view is you'll get better results. You'll get better policies. You'll get policies that will serve most of us rather than policies that fleece most of us and serve a handful of people. Let me ask you about the Democratic Party and mainstream media. I remember watching Bernie debate Hillary in 2016, primetime CBS, thinking you're not allowed to say what he's saying about the health insurance companies and the drug companies. You can't say that on primetime television. By 2020, he normalized that to a degree, but he was drowned out. Did he ever get an opportunity in front of millions of people to spell out Medicare for all without resorting to sound bites while Buddha Judge and Klobuchar spoke over him. Did he ever get an opportunity to spell out Medicare for all in front I, of? I think he I, I you know, I think he got some opportunities, maybe not maybe not fully unfiltered opportunities. And I think that the polls show that people, that it resonated, but I also think that what the experience showed is that there will always be powerful figures making bad faith arguments to try to undermine uh, that kind of proposal in a way that appeals to our worst instincts. Ultimately, Medicare for all, we talked about democracy and, and inclusion. And I think that ultimately a policy like Medicare for all requires a, a sense of a social contract between the government and its people. 
And that when the social contract breaks down, when people do not have faith in the government, when people see have, have been not wrongly, by the way, but learned to see that the government uh, is oftentimes only serving the very wealthy, it makes it much harder to realize a policy like Medicare for all. And it makes the bad faith arguments against Medicare for all, a policy like that, uh, much more potent because all of the arguments made against it are kind of weaponizing that nihilism over many years. I mean, it's why the the right has a much easier time of things that it, it it's got a kind of a self-fulfilling cycle, destroy the government's ability to provide services, then cite the government's uh, uh, failures as reason to continue destroying the government's ability to provide services, and then go to the voters uh, and continue saying, look at the government can't do anything, anything good at all. So that's a real problem. And I think ultimately we have to fess up to, you mentioned the podcast that I worked on, Meltdown, which was one of my, you know, one of my favorite projects I ever worked on. And Meltdown was about how in my view, uh, the failure of the Democrats to seize the opportunity after the financial crisis, to seize the opportunity to really uh, challenge Wall Street, reframe the economy, really, uh, you know, every crisis is an opportunity. The Democrats' failure to do that and their complicity with Wall Street, I mean, essentially their policies propped back up Wall Street, propped up the health insurance industry, that their failure shredded what was left of the social contract, said to people, even in a crisis, we were willing to hope, voted big time for Obama. And even in this crisis, uh, the government has decided to go all in for the people who literally created the, the disaster. And I think that ultimately shredded what was uh, already a tattered social contract, uh, sowed the disaffection. 200 plus counties switched, went, went Obama, Obama, Trump. Uh, and it, you don't have to believe me on that. I mean, it was Steve Bannon who said the legacy of the financial crisis is Donald Trump. And I think the Democratic Party has not fessed up to that. It doesn't want to fess up to that because its donors don't want it to fess up to that. But I think we have to understand that when people's relationship with government is so blatantly torched and people are so many people are taught a message of nihilism. That when you then go to voters and say, we have to do something like Medicare for all, you're going to have bad faith people like Pete Buttigieg and others in the Democratic Party in their own self-interested way, make a similarly nihilistic argument. Oh, nothing can be done. Oh, you know, it, it, this is not what people want. And essentially, the previous failures, the previous disasters have created the conditions for more nihilism. So how to break that cycle? It's very difficult. Right. The adults in the room are the nihilists. We're talking with David Sirota and everybody, please, as a favor to me, go to levernews.com and it's $8 a month. Support investigative journalism. You have a whole staff of writers and uh, it's it's great. It's worth reading. And I wanted to ask you about this latest piece you have entitled, They Are Not Even Pretending Anymore. Democratic leaders are joining with oligarchs to try to permanently destroy the progressive movement. Let me read you a quote. And we'll this is what you write. Democratic leaders just don't want avocado toast and mimosas. They want an outright counter revolution only not against the GOP insurrection, against the Democratic rank and file. And in many cases for the politicians, most hostile to the party's purported agenda. Explain that. Well, I think what you've seen in these uh, first uh, con congressional races uh, um, from the Democratic Party leadership is something that, that represents kind of a break from the past. Uh, in, in the past, up until about mm, two, four years ago, Democratic Party leaders, we're talking about you know House Speaker, top party leaders, would sort of tread lightly in contested open seat primaries. Uh, they, there was an idea that you know we have to let the voters pick. We can't be too heavy handed about putting the thumb on the scale in contested Democratic primaries. And in the last two to four years, you've seen something different happen. You've seen party leaders intervene very heavy handedly in House and Senate races across the country, trying to preference corporate aligned candidates, candidates who the party donors like, preference them in 
contested primaries rather than essentially allowing for a, a, a modicum of an even playing field for primaries to play out. And I think in this particular cycle, you've seen um, them backed up by these super PACs uh, that are funded by, you know, a, a kind of a rogues gallery of oligarchs, a, an oil mogul, uh, a crypto billionaire and the like. And that back, let's United Democracy Project. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think what's happened is, is that this has become very explicit. And, and in some ways, we should we should be thankful for that. There's no pretense anymore. They're not pretending. Right. They, they used to say, hey, you know, let the voters choose. And then maybe, you know, sort of behind the scenes, they would help one or the other candidate. But now it's just completely explicit, just totally explicit. And I think it's very a very revealing moment. Because what we're seeing is that the party leadership is saying, we want a corporate party. That is explicitly what we want. We want it so much that we're willing to intervene in far-flung primaries across the country, in Pittsburgh, in Oregon, in North Carolina. We are willing to come into local communities with lots of spending to try to buy local primaries uh, by running Republican huge amounts of money. At, they're right. using re Republican donor money, although, you know, the, and what running, Irwin in, in Pittsburgh, Irwin, who ran against Summer Lee, is a Republican yeah, union avoidance lawyer as well. Yes. So 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 I think it's important for everybody to understand that that this is not conspiracy theory anymore. Th this I mean, it never was conspiracy theory. But the point is, is that now it's undeniable. And so in a sense, I think we can be thankful for it because the party leadership is, is effectively being quite honest. I mean, look at what's going on tomorrow. It's incredible. The Democratic Party leadership has responding to the likely overturning of Roe by going in hard for an anti-choice Democratic candidate, also a candidate who gets huge amounts of money from the oil industry, Henry Cuellar in South Texas, against a Democratic candidate who is pro-choice in a primary. I don't know. You can't make it any more explicit. So I think the good news is, is that there's no pretense. This is what it is. And now we have to sort of, I guess, in our activism. Well, but there is pretense. You, you do have APEC putting up front organizations. I think it's called the United Democracy Project, which poured yeah. one point two million dollars yeah. into Henry Cuellar's campaign. And that's not out in the open. They're hiding. They're ashamed that they're I, guess, I, I, I think that's I think that's that's fair in one sense, which is that the which is that the money. Look, I, in my view, I'm not sure what exactly the money is motivated by. By that, I mean this. Some of these groups have the. U.S. Israel relationship as their as their brand. Other groups have, you know, vague, um, you know, sort of vague branding. I can't tell you what those huge donors are actually motivated, motivated by. But I can tell you, I don't believe it's a coincidence that the donors come from various industries that don't want progressive policies. Right. Like the. Uh, de de uh, Democratic Majority for Israel was funded uh, by uh, one of their big donors is a an oil mogul, a, a longtime Republican donor who they is an oil Nina mogul. Turner. Right, that was intervened yeah. for against Nina Turner for a candidate who just so happened to not be willing to co-sponsor her party's major Green New Deal legislation, major climate legislation. Right, right? so. I, I think it's it's not to say that the Israel issue or whatever Sam, the crypto billionaire is doing, isn't their actual issue. It's to say what we let's just say what we know, regardless of their branding. It is oligarch money coming in to support pro oligarch candidates or at least at minimum candidates who much less threaten the oligarchy and much less threaten the Democratic leadership, which, of course, is aligned with the oligarchy. So that that when I say there's no pretense, I would agree with you at a at a rank and file voter level, people who are not following exactly where every dollar is coming from. You're, you're right. It's hard. to. It's probably hard to know what's going on. But for for anybody who follows this at all, anybody. The, there is no pretense. The leadership is, is you know, it's, it's, it's I, I'm much more of as a journalist, I'm much more of a show don't tell. 
you know, you, you look at what the politician is doing, not what they're saying. And in this situation, we know what the Democratic leadership is actively doing. They went down and they're campaigning for Henry Cuellar right now. I don't care what they say about climate change or they, they, you know, they support abortion rights. You're literally campaigning for an anti-choice Democrat. That is showing, not telling. And we should all, there, there's no pretense anymore about what they are showing us. Okay, before you go, let me add, I have one final question. Thank you for doing this. David Sirota is editor-in-chief of levernews.com, L-E-V-E-R news.com, levernews.com, $8 a month, support investigative journalism. He's a great writer and he surrounds himself with great writers. Go to levernews.com. It has my guarantee. If you subscribe and you don't like it, let me know and I will pay you back. Alternative history. Uh, Bernie is a miracle of democracy. And I thought if Obama and Clyburn and whomever stayed out of it, uh, he could have been president. But do, do we have a, an infrastructure on the left that would have backed him up? Could he have ended up, if he had gotten elected, would he have ended up like Jimmy Carter? Because Jimmy Carter, uh, and rightfully so, got undermined by Tip O'Neill, Ted Kennedy, and the liberals in the Democratic Party. And they were right for doing that. They undermined his presidency. Wouldn't the Democrats have done to the opposite wing of the Democratic Party done to Sanders what the liberals did to Carter? I, I certainly think that dynamic w would be uh, potentially there. Uh, and I certainly think that the American left is is in a, in a somewhat weakened state right now in some ways, in some ways. However, I think the X factor would be that Bernie Sanders would not sit in Washington hoping to work out deals only playing an insider game. I think Bernie right. Sanders would be barnstorming the country using the bully pulpit of the presidency to actually activate and motivate people. Uh, and I think that would have there's a symbiotic relationship. I think that would have motivated community groups, unions, environmental groups and the like. You have not seen Joe Biden campaign for his agenda. You just have, I mean, it's barely happened. You certainly haven't seen him put any pressure on uh, recalcitrant Democrats on the corporate wing of the party. I'm not saying that would necessarily solve some of the gridlock problems in Washington. What I'm saying is that's something that has not happened. In fact, I would argue that's something that we haven't actually seen in my entire lifetime. Barack Obama, when he campaigned for the ACA, I mean, I, I you know, I was remember I was, you know, uh, I had lived in Montana. He went to Montana to tout conservative Democrat Max Baucus, who was watering down that bill. I cannot name for you a time when we have seen a Democratic president go to the states and districts of conservative Democrats and try to bring pressure on them. It, it, I can't name a time in my own lifetime where that's happened. I think Bernie Sanders would have tested that. I don't know if it would have been successful, but I think he would have tried. And that is more than you can say, certainly for Joe Biden, and frankly, more than you can say for any of the presidents uh, You know, in my lifetime, which basically is Carter, Cl Democratic presidents, Carter, Clinton, uh, Obama. You've seen Republican presidents do that. You just haven't seen Democrats do that. Right. And, and, Charles, and, and I, should, I should add, it, the reason you haven't, in my view, is because they don't want to, because this is, this is a game. This is their game, is to right. say the things because they perceive that liberals want the rhetoric. They want the speeches, but that liberals don't necessarily care as much about the actual doing of things, the actual getting things done. And they know that their donors don't want them to realize their rhetoric. They don't want them to do the things that they are promising. Jessica Schumer, Charles Schumer's daughter, Harvard Law School, is now a lobbyist for Amazon, mm -hmm. which means when the Schumers get together to discuss politics, they agree that it's complicated. <laughs> and they are not your friends, they're your enemy. If your daughter, it's, it's a reflection of your values. If your daughter 
goes and becomes a lobbyist for Amazon or if Joe Biden's press secretary and Obama's press secretary, Jay Carney, is now a lobbyist for it, for Amazon. It tells us exactly who who you are and what your values are. I certainly I certainly I don't want to speak to somebody's family member in the sense of I think, you know, it's hard. It's everybody has their life, a life of their of their own. But I do think I, I will agree with you that the Jay Carney example is so powerful. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, Obama's previous. Way, you have a great piece number with the lever about this. Yes, yes. You have a laundry list. Yes. I, I mean, I mean okay. yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it was Jay Carney. And before that, it was Robert Gibbs, Obama's press secretary, who then be, went, went to go work at McDonald's. Right. That is saying something about if the transition from a Democratic uh, being the spokesperson for a Democratic administration, if the seamless transition is to go from that to, to the spokesperson for McDonald's or the spokesperson for Amazon, that is saying something about the values and policies of the administration you represented. The fact that you can just move to that and that that's like, hey, that's that that's not a huge jump. That says it all. Right. And you would think MSNBC would have the decency and they have David Pluff on identify him as what is he uber what he yeah, said he was uber i don't even know what he's doing now but yes uber he was uber. did ariana huffington get him that job before you go i just want to introduce you to jason and pascal robert from the this is revolution podcast hey there this is uh david sirota and i will try to share him with you uh he was bernie's uh, chief speech writer during 2020. I was so, appearing on Kenzo Sabato with David Sorota. I don't know if that's you right. That's right. I remember that. Nice to see yeah. you again. Yes, we have an interesting conversation about yeah, house. That's oh, right. A while back. By yeah. way, congratulations on the success of your movie, by the way. Thank you. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I'm going to try to get you on This Is Revolution. Uh, you, no, I'd love to do it. This is great. David Sorota, thank you so much. I've been trying to get you on the show. For get in touch with me anytime. I'm so glad to do it. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you so much. And I'll plug your... your. Uh, Thanks again for that. Thank you, appreciate David it. Sirota. Thank it's good you. good to see you. All right. Great to see you. Thank you. David Sirota, by the way, is a brilliant writer. He really is. If you haven't read him, he writes clearly. And uh, he's an editor-at-large at Jacobin Magazine. And he is founder and editor of The Lever, Go to levernews.com, levernews.com, $8 a month, support levernews.com. It's investigative journalism, opinion pieces, and it's, uh, it's important.